being sick of me because next week you get to listen to me do a sermon. So, you yeah. uh, know. Announcements for today. We do have a couple things that I want to mention. Uh, number one, the caregiver support group, which is starting in May. There is a informational brochure on the Bolton board on the left if you have people who are interested in it. This is open to people outside the church, absolutely. So if you know people who are going through time of grieving and loss and would benefit from this, absolutely let them know. This is what the point of the, the this mission is. <laughs> oh, you know what?
sing that one and feel it. Uh, the whole how great thou art uh, is just it just makes you get goosebumps every time I sing this song. Next, we're going to turn to hymn three thirty six. Come thou, Almighty King. Certainly, good follow up to that fourth verse. And he shall come again. <laughs>
opportunities we'd like to take advantage of, that kind of a thing. That's the purpose of it. It's not going to be long and drawn out. We are a church that is very much unified, as has been proven. Um, thank you uh, to both Lee and Christina for uh, kind of stepping up to the plate last Sunday and stepping in where it's tough when one person fills two places. And Linda, we're glad you're back. <laughs> so uh, so we, uh, we're glad that uh, Lee and Christina stepped in to do that. Uh, other other prayer requests that we have, I've already talked about Terry. Um, another, just another comment that flyers are out there. I think he's printed up some more flyers for the Grief Share program. Please stop and pick one up if you know someone who has a need, if has a need in, that they're not dealing with grief well. Did you have another prayer request? Um, two things. Um, my husband's father. He's still having hip problems, um, just recovering from the fall. And then I have an update on my uncle, Gary Griffoff. There is a surgery scheduled for the tumor that's the size of a baseball. It's on his stomach, kidney, and intestines. They don't know if it's gone active because now he has an infection in the blood. So he's scheduled for Wednesday, and they're going to keep him for a while. Um, until they're able to get the test back from the uh, tumor to make sure they got all the and to see what kind it is. Okay. They haven't defined the tumor yet. They don't know what it is yet. No, they've been doing biopsies for this last uh, two, three weeks when I first gave you guys the uh, prayer request. Okay. Yeah, they figure they'll have enough with that amount that they're hoping to be able to know what it is. Yeah, if they take it out, they ought to be able to figure it out by there. Yeah. Okay. Uh, First you do. Okay, for anybody who doesn't know, I didn't make this announcement last week. I figured it would trickle out. It is now Dr. David Ferkel up who has this now. Thank you. And, uh, that's, and if you didn't already know this, this makes two Dr. Ferkel ups, Emily is also Dr. Perkola, and, and it's great to have people of that great power among our congregation, and we celebrate their successes over the years, and uh, we're certainly praising God that they're here, so, uh, and uh, they're, they're kids, and it's just, it's a great package, uh, what can I tell you, we love our kids. As I was looking out, it's already been commented that we have kind of a light congregation this morning, but as I was sitting there looking out, Either this side or that side, even with those <laughs> missing. Nine years ago, when we first came here, what was it, Bob? You figured how many people did you figure is here? Uh, 12, 15. Well, that I, I didn't let my brain think lower than 18. Okay, I refused to think lower, but Bob probably has a better figure. So praise God for the way He has worked in the congregation of His people. These are his, this is his people, this is his church, and we glory in being a part of it. So if there's no other prayer requests, it's just nice to see the church is on an even keel fuel line. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it did look like it was going to tip over. Maria? I have a thing for you, but it's our song. May I say, Steve, from Virginia, to be here yesterday. Your son from Virginia was here. Next Friday. Ah! I wish he was here. Uh, yeah, he's um, and um, mother in law. <laughs> yeah. I know. Okay. Um, After. I know you're not used to it, but this direction. Oh! <laughs> ah! <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, usually it would be Emma, but she's. And the, okay, we'll pray for Emma anyway. Any report on Emma this week? She passed. I've been praying for excellence, so that is no surprise. <laughs> I would say for everybody that is dealing with the heat, I I I have been praying for her so regularly I, I almost forget to mention it here because it's such a part of my norm. Alright, let's before we do anything else, before we go to prayer. Our memory verse this morning, as it has been throughout this month so far, Titus 3.14.
and let our people learn to devote themselves to good works, so as to help cases of urgent need and not be unfruitful. Titus 3.14 Okay, let's go to prayer. Father, as we contemplate that memory verse and think of the fruit, I pray that you will continue to make this church fruitful when we see the way you have blessed this church. This is fruit in keeping with the work you have assigned us. We thank you, Lord, that we have seen this church grow so much. We have people who have come in and been strengthened. We have people who have been saved. We, we glory in that your church is expanding here in this body. And we pray that you will continue to work in that same vein throughout the coming years. We pray that this church never again falls into the state that it was 10 or 12 years ago. We thank you that we are what we are. And the glory that we are yours above and beyond all things. We thank you for those things which we, for which we praise you. Uh, we've been missing some people. We thank you Linda's back with us this week. Uh, thank you that Alex seems to be in better shape uh, and uh, not knocked down as he has been. We thank you for the praises that we have, the joy we have with David's successes. Uh, and we, we thank you for the many people here who go through life succeeding because they are blessed by you. We often don't take the time to praise you for our individual successes in life. We take that moment this morning and we do that. We thank you for being so good to us. We thank you for being gracious to us. We thank you for, in all things, working for your glory. And we ask that you continue to do so through the years. Well, this morning we do pray uh, for Terry. We pray that as he goes into this surgery on Thursday, first of all, you would give him a calm that only comes from you, a peace that only comes from you. Do the same for Rosemary, for Becky, for Dan, uh, all those who are around him as family. Lord, we pray for peace in their hearts, and we pray that you will be uh, used actively in this surgery. We pray for the surgeon, the entire surgical team. We pray that he will be in and out of the surgical suite in record time with a great prognosis, and he will recover quickly. And it will not be a major upset in his life. And we put those things before you, Lord. We ask you to be with Henry Sr. this morning. He's having some real hip problems. I pray that you will be with him. I pray that you will comfort him. Uh, restore the function of his hip. And we understand he has a handful of other problems health-wise that uh, are troubling to him. And certainly wearing on the whole family and the dynamics of that household. And we put him before you this morning. Dominantly, we put him before you for salvation. We know, Lord, that only through Christ may we be saved. And we are not sure. As a matter of fact, we're rather convinced of the contrary. We're not sure that he has ever trusted you and made that commitment personally. And we pray that that does happen and does it soon. We pray that you be with... Uh, Melissa's Uncle Gary and the surgery this week, we pray that you will uh, guide the surgeons. It sounds like a very complex time in the surgical suite. And we pray that when it's all done, they will come up with an identity of the cancer. They will come up with a treatment for the cancer, and it will be successful. Strengthen his body so that he can fight off all the invasions that are going to be happening physically, chemically, radiologically, whatever they're going to be. And we pray that you will be with everyone involved in this treatment and bring him through this. Lord, we ask you to be with Emma, 104 degrees in training, probably much of it out on the tarmac where the heat has to be just beyond our comprehension. Give her safety, give her health, continue to give her great success. Uh, she is, again, one of the ones from our church that we look to to be triumphant in what she does, outstanding in what she does, and that she will glorify you in all that she does. Be with us through this next portion of our service, Lord. We come to you now in a time where we give to you or return to you a portion of 
what you have given us. You bless us so much, so often, in so many ways. Let us be equally generous as we return a portion of that to you. And may we use it well as a body here and around the world. In Jesus' name.
continuing through our Psalms of Summer here this morning in Psalm 47. We are talking to the deacons before we came out here this morning, and I, I had a reason for choosing all of these Psalms, but it, I, I went through the Psalms, and I go through the, the book of the Psalms probably three times a year in my personal devotions. It's just part of what I do. Uh, these are the psalms of this, this part that God put on my heart to do. And as I looked at them originally to pick which ones, uh, you know, I thought, oh, that isn't a terrible psalm. That's not a bad psalm. That's not a bad psalm. And then I started working on them. Well, we already know how Psalm 40, uh, was 43 turned out. Like, took me forever to get through. And I, 47 looked like a real simple psalm. And then I started to really study the psalm. So I'm going to warn you ahead of time, it's going to be a little bit of a word nerd psalm. There's some things in here that I have to break the word down a little bit, but not, not too much, not as much as I've done on New Testament studies quite often. Psalm 47. It's a common psalm. To the choir master, a psalm of the sons of Korah. Clap your hands, all people. Shout to God with the loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared. A great king over all the earth. He subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our heritage for us, the pride of Jacob, whom he loves. God has gone up with a shout. The Lord with the sound of a trumpet. Sing praises to God, sing praises, sing praises to our King, sing praises. For God is the King of all the earth, sing praises with a song. God reigns over the nations, God sits on his holy throne. The princes of the people gather as the people of the God of Abraham. For the shields of the earth belong to God, he is highly exalted. Let's pray. Father, as we look into this psalm, another mighty and very powerful psalm, extolling the name of the Most High. And Father, we pray that we come out of this with a new understanding and a deeper appreciation for the glory, the excellence with which we should see you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, you might notice that I don't clap to music very often. Excuse me, I had something fall. It's now stuck in my foot. <laughs> Ever have a sticky note that only sticks where you don't want it? That was horrible. <coughs> you may notice I don't clap too much. There's a good reason for that. If you ever watch me try to clap and Stanley's pleading the singing and he does this, I'm doing this. If he's doing this, I do this. I wind up clapping on the backbeat. I can tap my leg. I can tap my foot, no problem. But if I try to do two things at once, both arms, doesn't work. I'm just not multitask capable, I guess. <laughs> anyway, this is about clapping joyously. In our culture, we understand clapping in accordance with rhythm, which, as I said, I can't do. And then there's clapping in response to something which thrills us, that I can do. I clap with great enthusiasm when something really touches me. Uh, these are things that we look at as expressions of true emotion. Well, this is what we're talking about here. Clap your hands. We're going to look at really three things this morning. But before we do, I want to reference another hymn. It's a hymn I had to check with Diane and make sure we weren't singing it. I wasn't going to steal any of the thunder of the music. But it's one of those great hymns probably we, we know, at least no part of, the first verse particularly. Oh, worship the King, all glorious above, oh, gratefully sing his power and his love. Our shield and defender, the ancient of days, pavilion in splendor and girded with praise. What a glorious statement about our King God the mighty, almighty king. We worship and serve the one true God. And I can't state that with enough emphasis because there are so many things out there, what I'll call little g gods, that get in the way. There are other things that we worship, maybe not intentionally, 
but we do anyway. Anything we put before us in God becomes an idol, a little g God. On top of that, there are theologies out there that are close to worshiping the true God. But being close is not being right. And we strive to be right in all the teaching and preaching in this congregation. We make a point of being solid on our scriptures. Now, somebody else I was having a conversation with in recent history says, you know, being a preacher is really great because you're not paid to preach. If anybody thinks that you pay me for the one hour that I'm here on Sunday morning, no. you pay me for the study time that I put in to be able to do this. You pay us for the time, and I'm adding Sean in this, you pay us for the time we put in making sure what we bring you is right. It is the truth, because only the truth will set us free, as Jesus tells us. Some of these theologies are so close, and it takes a good fine-tooth comb to find the problem sometimes, but we must do that. But anyway, there's three things we're going to look at in this message this morning. The first is our response to the king. Uh, we're then going to talk about the nature of the king, and then the actions of our king, and then we're going to sort that out with what are we going to do about all this information. First is our response, and this is pretty easy. This psalm is one of those joyous psalms. Okay, it tells us all those things we're supposed to do. Yes, it was written into a Hebrew culture. And the Hebrew culture, anybody ever deal with any Messianic Jews? Yeah, John has. They're loud. They're noisy. They're joyful. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And those Messianic Jews have seen it, and they see the fullness of it. They're kind of rowdy. Okay, maybe we need to learn something from them. Because when this psalm was written, it's very clear, and it's hard to pick up the nuance there. But it says, clap your hands, all peoples, plural. There's an S there. And the word that underlies that in Hebrew means all mankind. We're not talking specifically to the Jews. Yeah, it was written into that culture, but it's bigger than that. All people of all time should be worshiping the true God, the one, the only God. It says we clap our hands and shout. Important to note that these are both imperative verbs, and if we go down a little bit further to verse 6, it's to be done with loud songs of joy. We're supposed to be singing. Wow. It's all imperative. I don't see any wiggle room in those imperative verbs. There's no excuse for coming into church and singing your songs. Glory be to the Father. You get it? I'm not pointing fingers at anybody. You notice I have my hands clasped on my arms, okay? I'm not going to point fingers at anybody. I'm not even going to point them at myself because I can be guilty of it some days because once in a while, you go to church and you're not in a frame of mind to worship. I hate to tell you this. Talk to any honest pastor, any honest preacher, they'll tell you the same thing. There are days it's tough to be up here and lead worship. It can be difficult. There's no wiggle room. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. We used that verse just a couple weeks ago, one of the Psalms of Ascent. It's marvelous to be able to come to church. I have to sometimes make attitude adjustments. Maybe that's why I park the car down there. Okay. <laughs> Because between there and here, I can get into the right frame of mind to worship. And maybe I need to think that over more often on a Sunday morning when I make that walk. Loud songs of joy. I, I know some people get a little bit upset when Diane presses that pedal down in the last verse. She, I think she flips switches. I don't know what she does over there. It's all magic to me. It's all magic to me what they do over here on the piano, too, I'll be honest. But this power that comes out of it, 
we should jump in and get behind that and sing these songs joyfully, putting the power into it. Yes, there are songs that should be sung, songs that should be sung in a contemplative mindset. Yeah, there are. But there are so many that need to be sung with joy and enthusiasm. And I fear that sometimes we get sidetracked. <coughs> Once again, full disclosure, what's on your mind when I say amen, I walk over there, turn my computer off, and then I walk to the back, and well, Diane's playing the last verse or two of the song, the final song. What are you thinking? I hope he's done quick. <laughs> Man, I need a cup of coffee. I gotta get home. I gotta roast in the oven. All right. I'm just telling you, these are things I know go on. I remember my mother just couldn't wait to get out the door to get home and get that roast out of the oven. Make the potato, mash the potatoes, make the gravy. Okay, I know these things happen. We need to prevent that because we serve, we worship an awesome, powerful God. What are we doing? Not doing it wholeheartedly. Um, as I said, the immediate context was temple worship, but I think there's a lot more there. And it's all because of the nature of the king. It says the Lord the Most High, the word that underlies that is Yahweh Elion. God the Most High. There are places in Scripture before the Psalms, back into the law, where you find Elion just there as a substitute for God or for Yahweh. The Most High. That's, if we think Most High, we should think God. We think most high is something else that should bring our thoughts to God. He is to be feared. And that underlying word for fear carries both the implication of me not being fear and a reverential awe. There are times by the context you will know that what the, the writer is thinking about is you should look at God and go, oh, and be leveled just by his majesty. And there's other places where we look at God and maybe our knees ought to knock a little bit because we know his holiness and we know our sinfulness. That's where our knees ought to be doing this a little bit. Anybody ever heard somebody whose knees actually knocked when they were nervous? I had a guy who was trying to lie to me one time in my work as a law enforcement officer. Oh, he had a lie all made out. He lit a cigarette, he about burned his hand, he couldn't even get it to his mouth, he about poked his eye out with a cigarette, and his knees were doing this. I suggest to you that we should some days look at God and our knees should be going like that. Because we are sinful creatures, and yes, we understand his justice, which I'll get to in just a minute. I'm skipping ahead in my notes here. But we have to understand his mercy, because without his mercy, his justice would prevail. And his justice is absolute, and his justice is perfect, and we are sinful. But it's because of his nature that we shout, sing, clap. We have to ask why, because he is a great king over all the earth. It is the overwhelming nature of this God that he should inspire this reverential awe and godly fear. We have to stop here just for a moment and note a heresy. Um, it's a heresy that kind of comes back to the forefront once in a while. Had a couple conversations in the last couple weeks with David over a specific issue. And I did some more research on it this week, and it seems to be, it's an older thought that the God we worship was one of many gods in ancient Canaan. That he was one of many, and over the course of time, he rose to be what I'll call the first among equals. And that heresy suggests that our Bible, as we have it, was redacted and rewritten to reflect the monotheism which we have. That's heresy. That is absolute heresy, and it's out there. 
and it is taught by some people in major seminaries, major, major Bible colleges, and other major parachurch organizations. That is a thought that is held. It's heretical. We worship the one true God. Anything else violates what is called the Shema. We've mentioned this before in preaching. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It also contradicts 1 Timothy 2.5. For there is one God, there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. This is God. We understand him as a triune God. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. There's no division. He is one. Because if you read the Bible with a full understanding of what we're looking at, you don't read the Bible in a vacuum, we see that the Lord, the Lord your God, is one. The people who were in a right relationship with God when that was written understood, Father. They may not have had the clear understanding of the Son of God, but they recognized it to a degree, and they understood the Spirit of God. <laughs> So we have to put that all together in a package. The Lord our God is one. His status and his nature are reflected in his actions, and we look at the actions of the king. And here the psalmist is speaking on behalf of Israel, or as Israel maybe. Uh, when he talks about in verse 3 that God subdued the other nations, okay, he subdued peoples under us and nations under our feet. He chose our inheritance for us, the pride of Jacob, whom we love. These are the actions of God in history. There's no question when you read through the conquest of the Old Testament, that all the histories, you get through, uh, you, you get past the Exodus and you move on into the histories. There's no question that God didn't work there. This army was just blessed by God. They walked through that in those nations because God did the work ahead of them. We can't spend the time this morning talking about the details of that, but there are many incidents. But let's just talk about Jericho. Come on. Jericho. March around the city seven times and it falls? That's man's power? No, that's God's power. That's just the first example, the shining example, and everything else goes the same way. He chose God, Israel's heritage, the promised land itself. And uh, the land itself is called, referred to here as the pride of Jacob. That's probably the easiest way to understand that. And Jacob is an all-inclusive term, meaning Israel, one of the many terms that is used over the course of, of Scripture. He's gone up with a shout. Now here it gets a little dicey, it gets a little interesting. This could be, and probably was when the writer wrote this, Probably was a reference to any one or maybe the many victories of God's people on his behalf or in his direction. As they went through the promised land, victory after victory after victory. Shouts of victory. Okay? And that's God shouting with victory on these things. Could also be a future reference to Jesus' victory over death. He's gone up with a shout. Or thirdly, it could be the shout of victory when Jesus arrived at the throne after his ascension. I suggest to you that all three are accurate. There was indeed shouts of victory when the armies made conquests. There's no question that that happened. And there was no doubt a shout of victory when Jesus arrived in heaven, when he went back to earth, conquering death, and then when he arrived in heaven at the throne and sat down at the right hand of the Father, I don't see how there could not be a shout of victory in there. So whether the psalmist recognized then that he was looking forward, we look back now and clearly see that that's messianic in nature. And then we look at the status of the king. It says his rule is over all the earth. And now, let's think of this. When we go back to Jesus' time on this earth, he says the kingdom of God is at hand. And I'll put a question out here and think through this. The kingdom of God is at hand. Anybody see glimpses of the kingdom lately? Let's be honest. 
Understanding the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is sovereign. God is sovereign. He is sovereign over all nations, over all the earth. But what do you see in signs of, where do you see signs, that God is king over all the earth? Well, I would suggest, I hope you see it when you come among God's people in church or among other groups of God's people. I hope you see signs of the kingdom. But other than that, boy, it gets tough. But let's go on with the text. In verses 8 and 9, taken together, we have another bit of a messianic glimpse. All the princes, and when I say that, read leaders, all the leaders of the earth gather. Now, this may have looked at the reign of Solomon, because when Solomon reigned, the people just flocked to him. They did. That's the nature of what was done in that culture. They came to this most powerful leader, obviously blessed by God. So it could have some, some look at that. But other than that, there has not been a time, and Solomon's reign was not all that long in the greater scheme of the length of the time of the earth. Uh, there has yet to be a time when it's obvious that God is king sitting on the throne, that all leaders come to him. This clearly looks forward to the time of the millennial kingdom. That is my best understanding of it, and I don't see how we can get away from that thought on that. So let's put that all in a package and ask the <coughs> dreaded question. What are we going to do with all this? Now, it seems like we're living in a world that's out of control. It's reminiscent of the time before the kingdom of Israel was established. The time of the judges, in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Folks, we're living in chaotic times. Anybody not notice that? And we're living in chaos. Sin is celebrated, not condemned. You with me on that? Evil is called good. Good is called evil. You with me on that? Lawlessness in developing nations is something we have expected for years, generations. But have we expected it in our own country? Have we expected the lawlessness that exists, particularly in our cities, where the cities seem to be powder kegs of violence, and there's a match on the way. I don't recall that in my growing up years. Nobody's to be trusted, elected officials, public servants, the media, even the clergy is suspect. I don't know how many people follow the Baptist press, but there's a man, another man, who has just fallen, Willie McLaurin. Great guy, I've heard him preach, I've met him. I liked him. He was director or president of the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention. Rising star. He was interim president, and then he was on a fast track to become the president. And they started checking in for his credentials, and all his credentials were forged. The mother mighty has fallen among the clergy. Well-respected Christian leader has fallen because of sin in his life. On top of the many failures of man, it seems like nature is ganging up on us. We're about ready to hit the hurricane season again. We were just talking this morning as the deacons were just having a little conversation before we prayed. You know, you can't get insurance in Florida anymore. You can't get insurance in California anymore. In certain areas for certain things, certain issues, and it's all because of the natural events that are happening. And this begs the question, is there really any king? That's a big question. We revert back to another psalm. Pastor Sean preached this last year when we began our series. Psalm 2, 1 through 6. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. You know, when we look at all this, we look at a time when the end is coming. 
Today may not be pleasant. We may not see the visible essence of the kingdom of God everywhere around us as we may like, but it's coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God and God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and every power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And then it says, the last enemy to destroy is death. Death is coming to all of us. We celebrated the life of somebody yesterday who died at 48 years old. One of the most lovely women you could <coughs> ever ask for. Okay. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. Okay. Again, back to Psalm 2. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Notice how he makes the service with the rejoicing. Kiss the son lest he be angry, and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. Folks, we have to take refuge in God. Our refuge must be in him, him alone, through his son Jesus Christ. Putting faith and trust in him won't change the outside world. It won't stop the lawlessness. <coughs> We'll stop the disasters, but it changes our ability to cope with it. An observation the other night, Monday, once a month for the last several months, we've been doing a preaching class for men from not just our church, but from several other churches involved as well. One of the guys from the uh, Grandview Baptist Church made this observation. Something to the effect of, you know, there's a chunk in Philippians 4 that makes a good counseling session all by itself with looking at nothing else. I'm going to read that to you this morning. Philippians 4, 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the people of God, or I'm sorry, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. He goes on from there. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, Think about these things. So what do we think about when disaster's around us? We think about the disaster. What do we think about when there's lawlessness? We think about the lawlessness. What do we think about when there's chaos? We think about the chaos. Listen to your conversations. Guilty, okay? Admitting it. Listen to our conversations. Whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable. These are the things we should be talking about. These should occupy our minds and our hearts. See, I cannot control, you cannot control what's going on in the world around us. You know, when I was an NCOM officer, I was the guy in charge. If I showed up on the scene, it was everybody went, oh, good, Bill's here. Sometimes I just winged it. Sometimes I really knew what I was doing. Sometimes it was just, they expect me to run this thing. I'm going to run with it. God is running with it. He knows what it's all about. There is no doubt. That's the God we're supposed to be worshiping. This can only be done if we trust Christ. Because Christ holds the key to all things. Christ died for our sins. It is he and he alone that gives us access to the Father. And it is only through this trust we can have a relationship with him. With this death of Christ on the cross, we can have a relationship with the Father. And if we can have a relationship with the Father, you know what? We should be able to clap our hands, shout with joy, and sing praises to our God. If you have never come to the point where you grasp this, it's time for a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with me, with Pastor Sean, one of our deacons, one of our deacons' wives, with one of our people here. If you're listening online, if 
you've never grasped the peace of God, we got to wait. we got things to talk about. Get a hold of us here. Come see us. Reach out to us on the internet. Talk to us because you need the peace of Christ that can only come by accepting Him, by trusting Him for your salvation. And as we close this, this morning, let's remember how glorious it is to worship this mighty God in our songs, in our praises, in all the things we do, because he is worthy of all his praise. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the mighty being you are. You are indeed the one true God. You are the almighty God. Anything that makes itself to be another God is a poor imitation. No God at all. Father, as we close this portion, I ask your blessing on anyone who heard this this morning and needs to understand the nature of salvation and the <laughs> absolute need of salvation. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
match appropriate and tremble to match appropriate. Let us look on you and your justice, your peace, your truth, your life. Let us worship you joyfully at all times. We ask a blessing on the rest of our day. We ask a blessing on the time of food and fellowship which we have. Dismiss us now. Keep us safe until we return together again. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.